I want to thank you for coming, and I wonder if you could introduce yourself to us. Hi, my name is Dave Farber, and I'm a, a geotechnical engineer with O'Brien & Gear here in Syracuse, New York. Um, let's see what else. I went to undergraduate school at ESF and graduate school here at Syracuse in civil engineering. Well, thank you for coming and sharing this project with us today. Uh, I was wondering if you could just give us a brief overview of uh, what was involved in the project and what it entails. This project that we're going to talk about today um, really deals with um, slope stability and things you would need to acquire in the field and then in the lab to properly run a, a, a slope stabilization analysis. Mm -hmm. um, the project is a local project and it consists of um, a slope that has two parking lots, one upper, one lower, and it's about a, a maybe 15 to 20 foot um, difference between the two in some areas and then it varies, it could be as much as I think 40 feet in the, in the worst case. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason why we need to run a slope stability on this project is because we're going to modify the slope and whenever you modify a slope you have to a analyze it to make sure it's going to be safe in its new, in its new state. So. All right. So um, you kind of touched on this, but uh, what reason was there to conduct this slope stability analysis if it has existed, you know, for so long beforehand? What, what, what changed, what conditions changed that's required this? That's a great question. What really drove this project was that we were um, going to collect some groundwater that had it to be collected and treated before it could enter the lake, Onondaga Lake. And in doing that, um, we are going to install a, a groundwater collection system and a stormwater system that's going to be, we're going to actually separate the groundwater from the stormwater. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we have to dig out at the toe of the slope, install a French drain, piping systems, pumping systems, and all that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in doing that, we have to run a slope stabilization. Okay. And then uh, for the project, could you uh, explain to us how the locations of the cross sections were determined? I, I, I know that it's a relatively large project, and um, how did you determine those? We always look at the worst case scenario when, when you're looking at slope stabilization. Mm -hmm. You want to try to find the area on, if you have, let's say you have a 3,000 foot long slope. You can't analyze the entire 3,000 foot long area. So what you want to do is you want to try to find a um, area that's the steepest or the highest groundwater or the weakest soils. Any one of those three would, would create a, a, an area that could possibly fail and would be your worst case scenario. So you would get, first thing, get topo of the area, mm -hmm. topographic survey. So you can see the contours, you can see the re relief of your upper and lower slopes. And then you would um, go from there, you would say, okay, now let's see what we have for soils. So we would do some borings along the top of the slope and along the bottom of the slope. And this would give you a good profile. And if you could, you'd also want to do some, some soil borings along the slope. We didn't do it in this area because the slope was so short that we could get a good look at the top and the bottom soils and they had a good correlation between each other so we could make the ties to, um, to develop a good soil profile. And when you do these borings, you also, you, you pick soil, different soils along your borings to have them analyzed in the lab mm -hmm. for strength characteristics. Um, and then the, the groundwater, you'd always, out, you'd get that automatically with the borings. You'd record mm -hmm. where the groundwater is, okay? Okay, so as a follow-up to that, um, could you uh, tell us more about the borings, how many were, how many bores were conducted and so on? Yes, uh, if we could just go to the, the plan. We did about a half a dozen borings on the site, um, some on the upper slope, some on the lower slope. And then of those, we chose the borings that had the, the softest soils, the highest groundwater, to have those soils analyzed mm -hmm. for um, shear strength, pretty much. We chose the borings, and we went to the, as far as the depth of the borings goes, you'd, in the, the upper borings, you'd want to go down below the invert of the, the bottom of the, of the, the slope. So you'd start like a, with an upper boring, say, an upper boring would be right here. And then you would correlate that with a lower boring. Um, it looks like we have a lower boring here. The depth of those borings would be, depend on the slope height here, let's say the slope is 30 feet high. So you'd want to go down on this upper boring, you'd want to go down at least 40 to 50 feet. 
and then lower point you can only, you only, only need to go down probably around 20 feet could you describe for us the cross section that had to be analyzed for this project sure okay uh, looking at cr this cross section we have a slow boring at the top and a slow boring at the bottom there's a top and the bottom What we're looking for now is the properties of this solid waste material. The fill is really a, a granular material, so that's not really of concern for a slope stability analysis. But the solid waste is its kind of like a clay, but not really. It, it acts like a clay, but yet it also acts like a silt. It has a cohesive property, and it also has a, a friction. So it has both cohesion and friction, okay? Whereas a strict clay would only have cohesion, no friction. And um, a silt would have a little bit of both, so it, it really it really does act as a silty clay material. It holds water. Our water is up fairly high in this slope, so that is a concern. Also, water creates pressure along the slope, so you always need to know where the water is, because that pressure is what destabilizes this slope and can cause a failure. So now, if we Let's just think for a minute. If we got to put in, if we have to put in a drain down here to collect this water, okay, we're going to dig a fairly decent size opening here, thus destabilizing this slope. So you need to know how strong is this soil right here? How strong is this soil? How strong is this soil? Those are the three questions that we need to answer before we can really analyze this slope. And to answer those questions, we go to a lab and we, we look for unconfined compressive strengths of the solid waste and any kind of silty material that's in there. Okay, so uh, what type of laboratory tests were used for, um, for this project and how are the number of these tests determined? Let's go to the, uh, there's a lab testing program and the number of tests is really based on how consistent the soil is. Is if you're once you run your boring program, if your soils are really consistent, you can reduce the amount of lab testing being performed. Um, lab testing can become very expensive very quickly, so you want to try to minimize it, but yet still you need to get as much information as you can to make a, a good sound decision on, on the slope stability. So on this one, we it looks like we ran some various undrained, consolidated undrained. And some we did, we did not do any any consolidation tests, and the reason being is that we we're not going to we're not going to introduce any new loads to the slope. If you were if you were going to build a building, or put a, a a fill on top, then you'd have to run some consolidation tests, also. Um, so, picking the different types of tests, we're always concerned about during construction and then following construction. So the undrained scenario is really during construction when, the, so, when the, the, the fine grain soils don't have time to let the water and the pore pressure dissipate and the water get out of it. So they become weaker than they would be long term. If in the long term state, the, um, the soils are able to drain and, and they become more stable with time as the water flows out of them. So we'd run the, the CUs and the UUs to try to see with, what, are the, what are the properties of the soil during construction, pretty much, and right after construction? That's, that's when the, st the slope would be the most unstable. So we ran those tests, and, and you try to pick your confining stresses for your CU testing. You pick three, so you get a nice, a nice, uh, nice curve, and it would, it, what it'll give you is your different confining, and usually you, you want to try to pick um, a pressure that's above and below and then right at where you're going to be in the final state. So you have a 3,000 PSF, 6,000, and 12,000. And you always want to double it so that the, you can get a nice line for, your, for your, the friction and also the cohesion of that material. So for this project, uh, a lot of UU and CU tests were used for testing the soils. Yes. And a lot of these soils did contain uh, sandy particles. Yes. So why were these C UU and CU tests conducted rather than a direct shear test? The direct shear test it, it provides great great data. It's it's um it does it's very valuable for more for um for foundation design, mm -hmm. um and it can be used for slope stability also. It is a valuable test. The there's such great correlation for for granular soils between the blow count material or the your standard penetration tests which you get from doing the boring, 
that sometimes it doesn't really, you don't get any additional valuable data on these types of soils, the, the sandy soils, mm -hmm. if you ran a direct shear. I'm sorry, a direct shear, a, um, yeah, direct shear. Um, so we elected not to run a direct shear on these, on these soils because we had enough with the CU and the UU, and also we had some great correlations with the standard penetrations. Uh, okay, so as you mentioned, that there's, there are those correlations between the SPT values uh, and uh, the, the values you would get from a direct shear test for the granular materials or the non-cohesive materials. And how, how does that apply for uh, soils such as like a, a solve waste? The solve waste is a very unique soil. Um, it, it really, it, you could get a blow count of one for STP and you think you have mush. But then you take that same sample you collect in a Sheldy tube and you bring it to the lab and you run unconfined compressor strength on it and you get a, a, a C value of 250 or 300 PSF and a friction of 20 degrees, which means it's a fairly decent soil that would be stable in this, in this scenario with the slope. So whenever you go out and whenever you analyze a soil and you see a blow count for an STP of one in a clay or something like that, always grab, try to grab a sample of that because you never know. It could have more strength than what the STP would have uh, would have led you to believe. Because really, a blow count of one on an STP is going to say that you, it's, failure is inevitable and it should have failed years and years ago. So it, it tells you right away that there's something that's not not matching up with the, the charts and the, um, the, normal, the normal types of soils, okay? And mm -hmm. you could run into those kind of soils any time throughout your career. You could hit soils that, that not, wouldn't be a solving waste, but they would be just a, a, um, a liquefiable clay that wouldn't react quite the same because when you're hitting that hammer down through, you're liquefying that, liquefying that clay. And in essence, you're seeing it very weak, but all of a sudden, once that soil has time to, to, um, to not be hit and shaken, it's a very stable soil. And in its natural state, when you build on it, it would be, in its, it, it would, it would be a fairly stable soil. You still have to account for the liquefaction and stuff like that, but um, you, could, you could design around it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It kind of went off on a tangent there, but anyway. So uh, what method or software was used for the slope stability analysis uh, for this project, and uh, why was that used, and um, how was the laboratory data that was collected implemented into these analyses? We analyzed the slope using both geoslope and stable. Um, the reason we, why we chose these, we felt that they're, they, these are both industry standards. And they're accepted by both regulatory agencies and also oversight agencies. So to get um, approval, it, it would be easy to use these. And also, we have a, a, um, a very good confidence due to they've been around for a long time. We've used them for 20 years, and they, they, they're very, very, good, very good programs. So we, and the reason why we use two is we always want you always, if you, have the, if you have the availability of two separate slope stability programs, it's always good to just check. Mm -hmm. each other against just to, just to make sure that everything's working out the same you get the same very similar answers you never get the same answer but you're very similar answers okay um, we also we analyzed if we could go to the to the slope stability now we we analyzed both the toe and also the um, the global stability this is still toe right here you're gonna see global in a minute but you can see actually you can if you want to step back for one second when you're, whenever you're analyzing, you always want to do it with the water table low and then re really low and then really high. So all different scenarios and then no groundwater at all. And you can see how, the, how, the, how it impacts it as far as slope stability goes and then the factor of safety. The factor of safety is given right here, okay, in case you're wondering. Um, and some of these factors of safety, if you see a factor of safety of 0.5, failure is, is going to happen. But look where it happens. It's a very small, all there's a very small surficial failure that really is irrelevant. It's it's more than just the, the the gravel itself won't hold itself at, at that slope. The ones you're really concerned about are in a second here. You're going to see. This is um, a little bit more global. You can see how this is more of a global look. Now the most critical one is right here. Okay, and in a minute you're gonna we're gonna talk about how do you fix this? Because right now this once we adjust this slope, put this this drainage swell in here, put our collection system in this. Next year we're going to come back here, and we're going to, this slope's going to be sloughed into this swale right here. And we're going to have a very upset client, so we're going to talk about how we're going to fix this slope so that it won't fail like that. 
Um, you can just see all the different scenarios we, we analyze for. Um, we'll get to the global one here in a minute. You can see it right from the top it goes. So th this is a deep-seated look at it. The most critical one was the 2.1, which is safe. See how, how far back it goes? Again, here's that shallow one. Look where it comes out, that same area right here, which we're going to address in a minute. How is the laboratory data used? You take the, you take the, C val the P value and the C value. You, pen you put that for the solvate waste into the program, okay? And also you put the thickness of it, the groundwater elevation, and then you put the fee value and C value for each one of these materials. Some just have fee, such as this one right here, just as a fee. You put that into the program and then let it chug. And it takes its method of slices, and you can, you can pick all different methods throughout the, within the program itself. So um, whatever method you choose will usually give you some, some good results. Can someone use a, you know, a slope stability chart to do these calculations to, uh, to analyze the slope that was given here? Absolutely, yes, yes. You can, it doesn't, the, the chart's good to kind of get you as a first look. If someone asks you, hey, is this slope going to fail or not, you can say, let's take a look at the charts. It's very quick, very easy, doesn't cost a lot of time. Go to NAVFAC 7.1, and they have some really great charts in there. Those are more for slopes that are, that are homogeneous slopes mm -hmm. in clays or sands. They don't really apply to a, a, a slope that's going to have a bunch of different layers, but you can get a, a, an estimate on should we look at this a little closer or shouldn't we? So it's a good, it's a good starting point, definitely, to use the charts. So uh, earlier you mentioned the factors of safety uh, through the analysis, and could you tell us what the minimum factor of safety was for this project and uh, what actions were taken to ensure this factor of safety was maintained? Okay, so the minimum factor of safety for this project was, was a 1.5, and that's for all projects pretty much nationwide. It, it's a factor of safety of 1.5 for long-term stability. Mm -hmm. Short-term stability would be a 1.3, 1.25, roughly. If, so during construction, if you can get your slope to be a 1.3, and then you're going to maybe dress it up and put some, some, some gabions on it and stuff like that, and then long-term is 1.5, you're okay. And then now for this project, we had some slopes. We consistently, when our groundwater, which is right here, was a, at a reasonable level. It's not real high, not real low, about mid-slope, and it's going to be there quite a bit. We're getting a failure, less than 1.5 for long term. So we say to ourselves, how can we fix this? Well, there's multiple ways. You can either make the slope so it's not quite as steep, take this part out right here that's failing. This, this, is, this is a weight that's pushing kind of like the soil itself. So if you take that slope and make it a, a, a shallower slope, then you would probably lower that factor of safety. But the owner does not want to modify this slope, so that's not an option, okay? So let's see, we go, can you do that? So can we take the groundwater and lower it? Well, to lower the groundwater long term is very expensive because you're going to constantly be pumping that water and sending it someplace. Or you have to have a, a, more real, a better relief system where you're, you're going to go deeper and you're going to draw that water table down so it's not, no longer in coming into, into this zone of soil here where it's weakening it. So that's not an option that we could use on this project, but you could use it on other projects. The only option we could come up with on this project that would work was we would put a buttress in down here. And by putting that weight in, you kind of actually got to run it out over top of, see where this, where this this um, fa failure plane breaks the bottom, you put the buttress right there on the bottom like that right there. And the buttress cons would consist of um, cobbles, in essence. So you'd put that weight on there and that would hold everything together. And the slope, that would drive your slope factor of safety up past 1.5 for long-term stability. When you put that buttress in there, though, you have to adjust your swale to handle the water still at the same time. You have to have, so you have to adjust your swale um, shape and also or slope. And that's how we that's how we address this problem. That's how we, we fixed the um, lower factors of safety that were below the 1.5. All right. So again, I want to thank you for coming and sharing this sure. project with us. Um, uh, I want to know if there's any last bit of advice you maybe want to give to the class before they embark on doing this uh, slope stability analysis and the um, the soil strength. Um, always go with your gut as far as analyzing a slope, and as far as um, your engineering careers go, 
sky's the limit. That's the beautiful part about being an engineer. You can do anything you want to do. Um, the, the world is yours, and I say don't aim low. Aim high as you can and, and go for it because you'll always succeed because you have a great background here at SU, and, and it'll, it'll all pay off in the end. Believe me. That's it. <laughs> That's all I have. <laughs>